Alright, so we're going to go ahead and open in prayer and then uh, get going from there. Oh, I guess I should mention one other thing. Um, I know I said I would use the same sheet so you would be able to color and keep your coloring, but the new sheet actually has something different on the back. So I apologize, but it's not a, it's not it's, it's more of an appendix type of information. So you can still keep your coloring stuff, but maybe just use the back of the sheet for for additional fun uh, historical details. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank and praise you that you have blessed us to not only gather together as your children, but to learn about the history of your family. I pray, Lord, as we now gather in study on that history, that you would bless and keep us in your word, always showing us the amazing joy that it is to be within your household. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> So I have to admit that when I uh, when I prepared this lesson, which was the week before Father's Day, and then I prepared my Father's Day sermon, which was this week, I didn't anticipate the overlap of my topics, but they are actually going to overlap a little bit. Uh, I guess that's good, though, because that way you can see and hear you know, different aspects of it. Uh, the focus that we're going to be doing on today is going to be kind of this second generation of disciples, okay? Remember, we've been going through the book of Acts, and we've kind of been going even through some of Paul's missionary journeys, but then it's kind of like, well, what about the follow-on, okay? What happens to the church as people, you know, start growing and having kids themselves, or as the disciples themselves start slowly dying off, either through persecution or through age? What about the second generation? Okay, and what we're going to focus on today is kind of the end of Paul's ministry, but then also the start of the second generation of the church. Keep in mind, this is all still within the first century, though. You know, this is all still before 100 AD. Okay? With that, uh, one other thing I should note I was uh, given feedback both when I asked for it. Uh, at the end of our Hebrew study, and then received the same feedback recently as well, saying that, you know, Pastor, you told us that you might try to keep these a little shorter to allow us a little more freedom. And I apologize because I completely ignored that feedback after the first time because I had to hear it a second time. And so my goal is to not finish at 11.45 anymore, but to finish at 11.30 is my goal uh, here on out. Okay, so they're going to be shorter lessons, but in theory, I'm going to also be able to uh, stick to them better as well. All right? <laughs> uh, so anyway, we are on page 7 of the, uh, the first 20 centuries of the church book, and we're going to be going over the Great Commission spreads. Okay? On Paul's trip to Rome, the ship ran into a terrible storm that sent the ship on the rocks near an island called Malta. Miraculously, no one was lost to the sea. While Paul gathered kindling for a fire, he was bitten by a viper, but the venom wondrously had no effect. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, would pen 13 epistles, or letters, contained in the New Testament, in which he quotes many Old Testament references. He clarifies Christian doctrine to various churches while he explains living out the Christian life. At the age of 65, he would be executed, or beheaded, for the faith by the Roman government. Though the Bible does not say tradition, uh, the historian Eusebius tells us of other apostles traveling to faraway places, like Thomas bringing the gospel to India, Mark to Africa, Andrew to Greece, and that they were all killed for the faith, except one, John, the brother of James. He was exiled by Rome on a, on a tiny island called Patmos. There, Jesus appeared to John in his old age, giving him both messages for the church while revealing many visions, some disturbing, regarding the future. John recorded numbers and images, many rooted in the old, or sorry, these in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. He filled with symbolic numbers and images, many rooted in the Old Testament, but also visions of heaven and Jesus as the victor who overcomes all evil in the final end. 
Conservative scholars maintain that after the first three Gospels, but before John's Gospel in AD 70, one generation after Christ Jesus' ascension and fulfillment of the promised Messiah, the Romans destroyed, destroyed Jerusalem and its great temple. Okay, meaning 70 AD was when they destroyed the temple, not meaning that's when he wrote his Gospel. Uh, this historical event, in, in effect, closed the Old Testament covenant in that its priesthood and sacrifices came to an abrupt end and remain such to this day. Okay? Any thoughts or questions right off the bat? Yeah? How come, how come they didn't rebuild? Rome was in charge of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Did Rome destroy Jerusalem or just the temple? Yes. They, they destroyed the temple, but they also destroyed much of Jerusalem. In fact, the fact that they destroyed Jerusalem is one of the reasons why the remaining disciples and apostles that were there ended up going out to the four corners. So they had no place to go, so they went to Rome and Greece. And yeah, Jesus. yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, the when you look at Eusebius, the historian they mentioned here, he does talk about some of that stuff and where they went and things like that. Uh, Josephus records the, the destruction of Jerusalem as well. It talks about like the river, the, the streets flowing with blood and things like that. Just even as being a Jewish historian. Well, was he Jewish? No. No. Yeah, just a, another historian. He was a Roman historian. And he knew a lot of it, but he. But he, he was in Jerusalem. Yeah, he was in Jerusalem. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, keep in mind, though. You know, I said this is the second generation. Okay. Notice that as we're going through this history. You know, he mentions that most of the disciples and apostles all died or were martyred, with the exception of John. Okay, this is the, called John the Elder, or John the brother of James, one of the sons of thunder, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, as John records in his own gospel. Okay, John actually lived up until around 100 AD. We don't know exactly when he passed away, but give or take, you know, five years from 100 AD, and you probably hit it within a, almost a 100% accuracy, because he lived a long time. And then you've got stories of the church fathers and other people talking about how even when he was so old he couldn't walk anymore, they would carry his litter out just that he could say, you know, God bless you children type of thing. Uh, John, I believe, did not write his gospel until the final thing he wrote. But he did write Revelation a little before then, probably closer to 90, 90 to 94 AD. Okay? Uh, you can debate the, the dates and stuff like that, but from what I've looked at the, and from the stuff that I've heard, that seems to, to fit the historical narrative and the Church Fathers the best. There, again, there are other people that debate that, but if you think of it that way, John didn't write his gospel until the very end, what would be the reason he wrote it then? It would be for the next generation of the church. Okay? The first generation, for the most part, was starting to get glimpses of the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? John, though, was the living gospel. He, he literally lived there, was there, you know, had been there, and was proclaiming this gospel. I would argue his sermon is what we now have in the Gospel of John. You know, I, I, I truly think that he basically told this same story, the thing in his gospel, up until he couldn't tell it anymore, and then he finally wrote it down. Uh, that's that's what I think. Uh, fits really well and it takes a really interesting life if you think of it that way. However, with everything, I have to give a grain of salt because this is not, uh, I don't have this like in a biblical account. There's no, nowhere in the Gospel of John does he say, you know, when I was 97 years old or however old he was, I did this. In fact, he doesn't even identify himself in his own Gospel except indirectly. Yeah? Um, so I've heard that John was so elderly later. And, and and they bring him in the meeting and say, John, give us a word and he'd say, love one another. You know, we say, love one another. Now, think of what, he used to be the son of thunder. So let's go kill him. 
He said, to kill the rumors, meaning the rumors about why the fire in Rome happened, which historians will disagree about. Some will say Nero himself caused the fire, you know, by decree so that he could clear space for new buildings. Others, you know, say that it's not. But Nero himself actually blamed the Christians, okay? And so to kill the rumors, Nero charged and tortured some people hated for the evil practices, the group popularly known as Christians. The founder of this sect, Christ, had been put to death by the governor of Judah, Pontius Pilate, when Tiberius was emperor. Their deadly superstition had been suppressed temporarily, but was beginning to spring up again. Not now, just in Judea, but even in Rome itself, where all kinds of sordid and shameful activities are attracted and catch on. First, those who confessed to being Christians were arrested. Then, on information obtained from them, hundreds were convicted, more for their antisocial beliefs than for fire raising. In their deaths, they were made a mockery. They were covered in the skins of wild animals, torn to death by dogs, crucified or set on fire, so that when darkness fell, they burned like torches in the night. Nero opened up his own gardens for this spectacle and gave a show in the arena where he mixed with the crowd or stood dressed as a charioteer on a chariot. As a result, although they were guilty of being Christians and deserved death, people began to feel sorry for them, for they realized that they were being massacred not for the public good, but to satisfy one man's mania. This is a Roman, by the way, a non-Christian writing this. Okay? He wasn't the biggest fan of Nero either. He was a fan of Rome in itself, not necessarily Nero. Um, but you get here, even from the perspective of a second century historian, some of the stuff that was going on and was recognized and the things they realized, like, what is all of this? Okay? Uh, the one thing I'll point out here, too, in this, it says you know, that he opened up his gardens and had for the spectacle. Uh, Nero actually had opened up his gardens for all the people who had been displaced by the fire. So not only does he bring the Christians in there and light them on fire as garden torches, but he does it in front of all the very people whose homes had just been burned. Okay? Yeah. So Nero, politician to the utmost, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now let's go to 1 Timothy as we continue this idea of the second generation of the church. Okay, 1 Timothy 1, and we're going to go through verses 1 through 5. 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 5, and then we're going to skip ahead to verses 12 through 19. Okay, so 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 5. Does someone want to read that for me? Whoever's got it. 1 Timothy 1, 1 to 5. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, and to Timothy, my own son in faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than the godly edifying which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Okay, so what's going on here? This is the start of Paul's letter to Timothy. And what does he start off with? He saw the people in Ephesus as caught on the false doctrines. He's not talking, the letter's not talking to people in Ephesus. Timothy is talking to people in Ephesus. Yeah. He's telling Timothy to stay in Ephesus and stop, try to stop the false doctrines. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what is the relationship here between Paul and Timothy? True son in the faith, it says. Okay, true son in the faith, yeah. And so what's happened here is Paul was the father of all these churches. He started all these churches, okay? 
but then Paul had to pass on those churches to the next generation. Timothy ends up being the, the elder or the pastor, or even if you want to call it this, the bishop of these churches. Ephesus being the epicenter of almost all the churches in Asia Minor or Macedonia. Okay? Alright, so Timothy now basically is, is taking the reins, and what is Paul doing? He's giving him kind of the, his, his marching orders, right? Hey, this is what you need to focus on. This is what you need to, to, to highlight as we go forward. Paul knows he's not going to be there forever. But he also knows that God's given an amazing field of workers to carry on and carry out the harvest. Okay? And so now let's skip down to verses 12 through 19. Someone read that. I'm so grateful to Christ Jesus for making me adequate to do this work. He went out on a limb, you know, entrusting me with his ministry. The only credentials I brought to were violence and witch hunt and arrogance. But I was treated mercifully because I didn't know what I was doing. Didn't know who I was going against. Grace mixed with faith and love poured over me and into me, and all because of Jesus. Here's a word you can take to heart and depend on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm proof, public sinner number one, of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. And now he shows me off, evidence of his endless patience to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. Deep honor and bright glory to the king of all time, one God, immortal, invisible, ever and always, oh yes. I'm passing this work on to you, my son Timothy, the prophetic word that was directed to you, prepared us for this. All those prayers are coming together now, so you will do as well, fearless in your struggle, keeping a firm grip on your faith and on yourself. After all, this is a fight we're in. There are some, you know, who by relaxing their grip and thinking anything goes have made a thorough mess of their faith. Uh, I met us in Alexander, two of them. I let them wander off the scene to be taught a lesson or two about not blaspheming. Okay. So, again, what's happening here? If you were thinking of this in kind of the, the, the universal church context and the history of the church, what's happening here as well? Paul is encouraging Timothy, mm-hmm. reminding him of you know how Paul ends up with this role, and how Timothy honestly is better qualified for it than Paul was. Because you know Timothy didn't have all this other stuff happen to him that Paul had happened to him. Okay, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief sinner number one, as your translation put it, right? Or of the foremost in the in the ESV. Now, okay. In other words, hey, we are all going to make mistakes. We are all going to struggle in what God has placed before us. But yet it's God who has the power to overcome. It's God who's going to carry us forward on this mission of where he's placed us. Okay? So you can see this whole this, this, uh, this way the this second generation is already being brought up. You know, being taught the lessons of the first generation, being, you know, prepared for what is to come. Paul also wrote in Ephesians, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay? Ephesians, keep in mind, this letter was written to the church in Ephesus, but we actually have some different copies of this letter that will, instead of saying to the church in Ephesus, will actually have some other church name there. The exact same letter, just a different church name. And so it's like, wait a second, is this the letter to the Ephesians, or is this the letter to the Laodiceans, or is this the letter to the, this other church, or is this the letter? Probably what happened was 
the letter that Paul wrote to Ephesus was always intended to be a circular letter. And so they did actually copy it with the new church's title because he wanted it for them as well. Timothy, being assigned to Ephesus, very well might have been the one helping, not necessarily carry the letter, because if I remember correctly, there is an actually carry your person in the letter mentioned, but could have been the one actually supporting and encouraging the people in the content of this letter to the Ephesians. Okay? So again, Paul's writing this stuff because he's trying to pass on the information that he himself is no longer able to do. Which is kind of the way second generations of things always happen, right? The first generation is getting old, they start dying off, and what do they do? They pass on everything they can, give every advantage to the next generation of people. Whether it's Christianity or whether it's a farm. You know, that's a true you know, scenario. Any thoughts so far before we go? We're going to go to Second Peter next. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, behind you, yeah, actually. It's a little bit better than it is not all, as it was then, because now we do that same thing that we call the books and printed by the thousands and millions and keep them. In those days, that was the first transmission of the gospel was all oral. <coughs> and when something like this was written down, it wasn't a throwaway thing. That was a precious thing that had been passed around because it was the writings of their teacher. Yeah. It's interesting, too. One of the arguments, actually, for the later publication of each of the Gospels by each of the authors, you know, whether you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you know, Luke, even himself, he's like, yeah, I've been living this for quite a while now, and yeah, I've done a thorough investigation of all the facts. I think it'd be good to put it in the writing eventually. <laughs> he actually kind of lays that out there. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of at the end of this. I need to put it all to writing. Okay? Uh, the argument is, is that when you're talking to a crowd, when you're talking to, you know, people, back then, the authority was not on the written thing you were referencing, but your ability to say it and live it and witness it yourself. Okay? And so if they had written their gospel message down early, it probably would not have been taken with as much credit or with as much authority as if they had just verbally proclaimed it. You know, you think back, though, to other factors back then, like, for example, the literacy rate. The literacy rate was nowhere near what it is today, and so the, your mobs of people would not have been able to read it even if you had written it. Okay? And so it makes sense that a lot of your teachers, a lot of your knowledge was passed on orally for not only the sake of being able to hit a larger audience, but also the sake of this is where you actually gain your credibility in showing and living and testifying to what you yourself knew. It was actually considered bad form many times to quote something verbatim. And instead, they wanted you to paraphrase it to show that not only could you quote it, but you could understand it in such a way that you could put it into your own words. Which really messes with our biblical scholars today when they reference direct quotations from the Old Testament and things like that. Because many of them aren't direct quotations. They're actually paraphrases or cover a larger topic, a larger thought. Hebrews is crazy because not only does he do a pretty specific quotation, but then he like just goes crazy explaining it in all sorts of interesting ways. And it's like, wow, I never would have gotten that out of that original passage in the Old Testament because we didn't have the context. We didn't have the Holy Spirit to guide us in that understanding. Yeah, so, so yeah, very, very good point. The, the argument is made, and that's one of the reasons why the argument is made, is that all the Gospels, whether it's Matthew, Mark, or Luke were all written most likely at the end of that evangelist's life. Um, there is some debate on Matthew and Mark on which one and when that was written, but I think it makes sense to kind of just focus on that as far as why this would make sense. Luke, 
as I said, he kind of lays it out in there. He's like, I've kind of lived this and been here and done all this. And you know what? I really need to write this down. Yeah. Uh, John, in the same way, kind of uh, you know makes sense, especially with all the unique things John adds in that isn't in the other Gospels. It's like, wow, John is kind of carrying over. You know, everyone else already knows the other stuff. He doesn't want to repeat past stuff. He wants to make sure everyone has the larger picture. Which is why John even says, if there was, you know, if we wrote everything down, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to cover everything that Jesus did. Yeah. In those gospel works you can take your letters addressed to somebody to convey information. They're just like for everybody. Yeah. They don't have a specific address scene. Yeah. No, they were more of a book versus a, a letter. Uh, Revelation's unique in the sense that. It appears more like a letter, but it is almost kind of a book in and of itself. Uh, in fact, you could argue that uh, First and Second John were kind of the, the encapsulating letters for the Book of Revelation. You could argue. Uh, anyway, again, Second Generation Church. How do we make sure that we support this task that Christ has given us to do? Okay, let's go to Second Peter now. Again, this is probably written at the end of, of Peter's ministry. Okay, so go to 2 Peter 3, and we're going to go through verse 14 through 18. So verse chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, which is the last kind of paragraph of his letter. Anyone got that? 2 Peter 3, 14 through 18. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that he may be found with him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in, in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, under their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Okay. So again, Peter writing to the church, encouraging them to do what he has charged them, what Christ, in, in through Peter, has charged them to do. And then also reminding them of kind of the other you know, aspects of the faith that, and fathers of the faith that they can lie back on. Right? Paul's letters. <laughs> right here, Paul is probably dead by this point. You know, it's, again, it depends on when he dates his death and when he dates this letter. But Paul very likely might be dead by this point. And yet he's still encouraging them, hey, you know, you need to also utilize the other disciples, the other apostles of our Lord in their resources. Okay? Which starts becoming an interesting theme as the church moves forward. Remember, the, the New Testament that we you know, hold dear today wasn't always, you know, from its very first day the letter was penned, collected together in this unified volume that we have. Okay? And so it, was, took, it took time for the church to realize, hey, we're all using the same stuff. Why don't we put it into one volume? And the other aspect of it was technology. You, you didn't have the ability to make large volumes of works because you didn't have the book. You had more scroll form when this all first started. And it wasn't until the book form started coming more pop, becoming more popular that you started seeing groupings of things. For example, Paul's letters or the Gospels, they started getting grouped together. Yeah? In verse 16 of this passage you just read, mm -hmm. this is NIV. He talked about Paul's letters. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, 
as they do the other scriptures. So that's reference to the scriptures right there. Do you suppose that it only to the Old Testament Torah and the prophets, or do you think it includes the Gospels? I think he's referring to the, the Old Testament Torah there. Uh, the Gospels would not have been widely circulated yet, although some of them would have been written by this point. They would not have been widely circulated, so perhaps individual churches would have had them by that point, but not you know, universal uh, circulation. And so the, the scriptures, this is really interesting, right? He says, you know, pay attention to Paul's letters as to other scriptures, right? He puts them in the same category, okay? In other words, the other aspect of the second generation of the church that you need going forward, especially as we get into third, fourth, and et cetera generations of the church, where is your authority in your teaching? Are you in line with what Jesus proclaimed? Mm -hmm. And that starts becoming how the Bible itself in its current form is defined. Okay? So much so that by uh, the, the second century, or sorry, the, yeah, the second century, because this is the first, the second century, so in other words, uh, 200 plus AD, by the second century, no, I did the backwards. Third century. Third century. Yeah, the third century, so 200 plus AD, you actually get a, a man by the name of Irenaeus who basically has to codify and lay out, hey guys, this is what we've been doing for the past 150 years. Why are you screwing with it? You go back to Jesus. You go back to his direct disciples. You go back to John. You know? That's what you need to stick close to. Stop going off the wild and the wild wilderness of your own fallacy and your own knowledge. Go back to where the authority lies, which is Jesus himself. Okay? Um, the difference with Irenaeus, though, is by that point you did have kind of a relatively universally codified New Testament. But you still had this problem of the teaching was more valued than the written. And so you had a lot of teachers who were teaching things contrary to the written. And so here it is. It's like, no. If you're teaching something that doesn't fall in line with the written, then you're wrong. If the written doesn't fall in line with the apostolic teaching, then you're wrong. And he actually created this, you know, the way he uh, codified this was what he called the rule of faith where you actually do have to balance both the teaching and the writing off of the original source material, which would be Jesus, okay? Uh, but we're not to the third century yet, so I shouldn't get ahead of myself. <laughs> okay, second generation of church. Key focus, key idea is preparing the church to carry it forward, okay? How did Paul do that for Timothy? Wrote his letter. Wrote his letter. Encouraged him. You know, upheld him in the faith, right? How did Peter do it for the church? He wrote letters too. Wrote letters too. Again, encouraging them to rely upon the apostolic teaching, right? What about John? How did John do it for the church? He was there. He hadn't died yet, right? By the time John dies, we're actually getting into the third generation of the church. John was there, living it, actively being, you know, in a sense, the bishop of the church after the death of Peter. Peter was kind of the, the you could call him the first bishop. If you want to go to the Roman you know, theology and say he was the first pope, but I don't know if you can go that far. But, <laughs> uh, but John then was the only remaining of the twelve disciples. And so he was the, the tie for that second generation of Christians. Okay? Any final questions or comments before we close? Well, uh, yeah. documentation is 
is real important. I, I, know, I know like in the medical field, which some of you are, that can prove that something occurred mm -hmm. and, and this fits with this and I am really trained. So I'm here, oh yeah, so, so this is verified like Aristotle, they've got like three copies or something in ancient writing. Mm -hmm. With, with the Christian manuscripts, you've got like 500 ancient manuscripts so far away. Uh, yeah, so the number you're looking for is actually 5,000. Oh, 5,000. Yeah, but, okay. but, but the, the point, let me kind of go ahead. Your point yeah. here. So the, the idea is, is when you talk about archaeological evidence for the Bible, right, or for Jesus himself, you start going back to, okay, well, what what antique and you know, manuscripts from antiquity do we still have? You know, what can we actually go back and reference and, and find all that stuff? Well, something written in a relatively similar time period to Jesus, it was actually a little before him, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah. Ever heard of that? Yeah. Pretty popular, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. We've got like less than five copies of that. Mm -hmm. Sound like it must have been super popular if we've only got five copies? I don't know, maybe not, you know? Okay? <laughs> you go to something as common as Shakespeare. Again, <clears throat> pretty sure he lived, pretty pretty positive that he was a real person, right? Yeah, sort of. You go to the New Testament, to Jesus. And the amount of biblical and extra biblical reference to Jesus is several orders of magnitude higher in the copies we currently have. As I said, there are over 5,000 Greek copies of different New Testament manuscripts that we have in, in you know, history museums and things like that around the world. If you go to the Latin, that number jumps up into the tens of thousands. And some of the Latin ones are actually older than the Greek ones because the original Greek was lost for some of them, but they still had their Latin translations. Okay, there is more proof, archaeologically speaking, that Jesus existed and roamed this earth than there is that Shakespeare existed and roamed this earth. Yeah. yeah. Even the epic of the, of the Iliad, the Odyssey, Three orders of magnitude, four, four orders of magnitude, right? Greater for just the Greek copies than anything else written in the Greek, which the Iliad Odyssey was written in. Okay? Now, this is just from a not, not a biblical or a faith based focus, but a purely archaeological, you know, manuscript evidence focus. Just a astounding difference between this and other things of similar age. Okay? That's a good way to tell a non-believer. Yeah. 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 So it is, it's very edifying to the faith. Uh, one thing, though, you do have to remember, remind yourself of, of not a single New Testament or Old Testament book do we have the original autograph, the original thing penned by the original author. All we have is copies of copies, or perhaps just a copy of the original, depending on which one, but you know, you know, there's no way of knowing you know, how many copies were made before. But the joy of having such a vast number of copies, you can then do what's called text criticism. You can compare the copies to each other and say, oh, well this is what the original would have had to say because every single one says the same thing. Or, oh look, they all say this a little different, but this one says it this way, and you can see how the person would say, oh, I want to change the spelling of this word and do it this way. Sometimes not even intentional. But so it's a fascinating field of study that's way beyond you know, <laughs> this, the focus here. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Well, let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you gave us the church to be our household of believers, to support us in the faith, to encourage us to carry the faith forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.